Yeah, I think that um, is Laura, were Candida and Andy gonna come, do you know? Um, I think Andy said he couldn't, but Candida was going to try. She had something okay. else on, so she, she'll try and be here. Okay, great. Well, I just started recording, so if uh, so you can see it and they can see it. Um, right, okay, thank you. All right, so welcome. So I'm the facilitator, I'm Susan Holman. Um, so I will just facilitate. So I wanna welcome everybody to our Remedy Article in Progress workshop. And this is on Laura Smith's really, really exciting paper. Everyone I've talked to has said they can hardly wait to talk about this. Um, and I will, um, my purpose is just to encourage each of you to, to talk and, and to help be a timekeeper. Um, one of the things I love about Remedy is that it's an international working group. So we work, but we're a group, we work together, we aim to provide opportunities to support and cheer on our colleagues. Uh, we aim to nurture growth in, in our subfield. So I thank you so much uh, on behalf of all of us for dedicating your time and your expertise today. And just a reminder, we are recording this, but it's just for Laura's use only. Uh, so no one else will, will, will access that or see that uh, outside of this group. Um, so what I'll do is we'll start by giving each of you a chance to introduce yourselves. I can probably call on you from my screen just to avoid questions um, and then end with Laura. And then um, as we end with Laura, Laura can introduce herself and say anything she'd like to help us orient us to, to, um, to your paper, Laura. Uh, and then we'll focus the next, um, however many time, much time is left, 45, 50 minutes on individual feedback from invited respondents. And uh, that might be six to 10 minutes a piece, depending on, on you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you to judge time and I'll watch the, watch the clock. Um, and just also as a reminder, everyone is invited to upload written comments you have for Laura into the Google Drive. So if you don't have a, if you don't have a chance to talk, you wanna say something, there's, there's the Google Drive to definitely give, give your feedback. Um, so I will just start on my screen and, and go around and actually um, start with Ellen. Hey everyone, I'm Ellen Muehlberger. Um, if you've encountered my last name in print only and never heard it actually said, it's said like a hamburger made out of a mule, much simpler than the actual German pronunciation that whatever came with, so just mule burger. Um, I'm a professor of history at the University of Michigan. Uh, do you want us to say anything else, Susan? uh that's fine for now but feel free to say anything else if you wish ah, no i mean it's just it, it's happy making to see everyone on the screen and to meet some people for the first time so i think laura we have maybe been in the same room but maybe not actually met and christian the same way it's just nice to see everyone right uh christy you're next on my screen Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Christy Epson Saya, also a last name that is hard. Um, and uh, I am uh, a professor in the Religious Studies Department at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Great. Uh, Christian. Okay. Hello to all of you. It's so good to see uh, so many faces and so many uh, well-known names and and uh, it's the first time I guess I'm I'm here in in one of these uh, seminars or workshops of of the remedy so it's it's an honor and a pleasure to be here so also my last name might be a bit of a challenge but it's actually Lars so just with a long uh, a so I'm Christian Christian Lars uh, I'm a professor of ancient history at uh, the University of uh, Manchester. And I think most of you, uh, well, I have like several interests in what I call social and, and cultural history, but I think most of you will know me from my work on um, disabilities uh, in antiquity. Great, thank you. So Heidi, you're next. Hello everyone, I'm Heidi Marks. I'm um, co-founder and co-director with Christy of Remedy, and I'm a professor at the University of Manitoba in the religion department. I'm also an associate dean in the faculty of arts and work on ancient medicine, but um, sort of moving into more maybe ancient science in the next little while, but still uncertain having just completed that big source book. I'm gonna probably take a little pause and figure out what to do next. Thanks, Susan. Yes, the source book with all of you. Great. 
Victoria, you're next. Oh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Victoria Leonard. I am a research fellow at the Centre for Arts, Memory and Community at Coventry University. And I'm also a research fellow at the Institute of Classical Studies, University of London. Um, I, what have I been working on? I'm working on, I do, I do quite a few different things. Um, I edited a volume on bodily fluids in antiquity with Lawrence Tatelan and Mark Bradley. That came out in 2021. And last year I published my monograph on late antique historiography. Um, but at the moment I'm working on gendered violence, basically. Thank you. Uh, Misa. Hello. So, one again, so thrilled to be here. I'm Misa Nguyen. I'm a four-figure PhD student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, advised by Beth Diggerser. Currently working on, hoping to start work on a dissertation about social history of pregnancy in the early empire. Thank you. Brenda. Hello, I'm gonna break tradition and not pronounce my last name. So you can just guess. <laughs> what it is. Um, I'm a professor of early and medieval Christian history at Pacific Lutheran University in Washington State. Um, and my elevator pitch is that I write on martyrs, monks, money, and medicine. And last but not least, Taylor. Hi, everybody. Taylor Petrie. A uh, huge honor to be here. I, I love and respect everybody's work and, and some of you are meeting for the first time as well. So really glad to be involved. Uh, I'm a professor of religion at Kalamazoo College in Michigan and work on uh, gender and sexuality. Great, thank you. And I should qualify my own self. I'm Susan Holman. I, I am a professor in religion and the healing arts at Valparaiso University. So now we'll turn it um, over. Laura, just give us, Laura, you can uh, get, let you introduce yourself, say whatever you'd like to say about to help us set us up for this. Um, and then after, after that, I will call on Ellen, Taylor, Christian, Victoria, and Brenda. Actually, Christy, I think you're gonna be first. Um, yeah, it's just to keeping, okay. So Laura, over to you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm so excited uh, to be here and to be with um, all of you. And um, so I probably have the easiest surname out of you all to pronounce. <laughs> um, good evening, good morning, depending on wherever you are in the world. Um, I'd like to start by saying an absolutely massive thank you to everyone for coming and being here and, um, give, and for Remedy for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who read my paper because it's not the shortest paper in the world. Um, so I, um, at the University of Birmingham, uh, just about to finish my PhD. So I'm just writing the conclusion and then done. Um, uh, my supervisors are Candida Moss and Andy Merrills at the, at the University of Leicester. And um, so this, this paper is, um, the final chapter in my thesis. My thesis itself um, explores the suffering female body um, in late antique aesthetic literature. Um, but this chapter is a little different and hence why I'm here today. Um, so this chapter explores the suffering female body from through the, the life of a male saint. Um, and I think, I think this paper draws important conclusions relating to the study of illness, gender, sexuality. Um, and I'm really keen to develop this chapter into, into a strong paper that could be published in the future. Um, so um, with that in mind, I'd really appreciate any uh, feedback you have um, that might um, hopefully strengthen my work in the future. And just again, a massive thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you, we are so Thanks. thrilled. All right, so we'll start off with Christy. Great, awesome. Um, Laura, thank you so much for this paper. It was it was really fun to read. And I, I am confident that it has potential to be published. So, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes when we read these, we're like, I don't know which directions you go. But yeah, you've got a persuasive argument. You've got great sources. I think everything is here. It's just a matter of kind of reworking it into an article. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, so uh, first, let me tell you what I think your argument is. Sometimes I think it's helpful to speak back to you just to 
so you know what readers are getting um, from the piece. And then um, I have two types of comments. Um, so your argument, as I see it, um, you are working on uh, the previous work of scholars. I think Ellen is one of your main interlocutors. So I would say, you know, really elevate um, that conversation. I also think Maria Dorfler is a conversation partner, and I've put in the Google Drive folder an article that I think you can use to kind of position yourself between Ellen and Maria. Um, you are calling attention to gender transformations in late antiquity with respect to depictions of male folks becoming unmanned. So you're counterbalancing all of the scholarly attention to depictions of female folks becoming manly by, by looking at the opposite side of the coin. And you are using Simeon as your central case study, focusing on two scenes related to Simeon's wounds in the history of Theodoret and a merging of those two scenes in the homily of Jacob. Um, in terms of impact to your contribution, I think you say it perfectly what you're doing. <laughs> um, your paper contributes to the study of gender in antiquity or understanding of gender in antiquity, as well as being part of the redress called for by Max Strassfeld um, for trans people and trans studies. I think you've perfectly identified and articulated um, why this study matters, which is great. Um, okay, so I've got two types of comments for you. The first, and I think these are the major, I think your argument is there, um, but my major comments have to do um, with translating a dissertation chapter or a thesis chapter into a scholarly article, a standalone article that better showcases your arguments and your contributions. Um, and then the second set of comments have to do with just fine tuning little bits of the argument to make it even more persuasive. Um, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first type of comments, and then um, I'll kind of raise some things in the second type of comments. And all this is written down, um, and I've got it listed in numbers one, two, three, four. So it, it should be easy for you to track later on. Um, um, so first, um, what you've sent us is uh, a dissertation chapter or a thesis chapter. And the job of the dissertation is to demonstrate to your committee that you've read everything. <laughs> you've read all the relevant primary and secondary sources. You've mastered the historical debate dates and context, et cetera, um, you're essentially trying to prove that you know your stuff. And I think that this chapter accomplishes that. It's very clear that you have read capaciously, you understand what's going on, you can articulate um, all of the sources and the historical, um, uh, the historical stuff uh, uh, accurately, fairly, charitably. Um, so congratulations, I think that's great. Um, in a scholarly article, a lot of the stuff that you're kind of proving in this chapter, you don't have to prove. Um, uh, you can assume that we as your readers know it. Um, and um, so that's great. because that means that a lot of this can kind of be trimmed out, um, as you said, as you even uh, recognized in your cover letter. Um, so, so there are points in, um, uh, Oh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so I think the best strategy for focusing and trimming is to think about what you're doing right now is you're bringing in all of the ancillary sources related to the topic of the chapter. And I think the way to, to kind of conceptualize how to trim is to think about what are the sources and contexts you need to corroborate your argument. So you don't need all of those sources and contexts that you talk about they're not all directly relevant to your argument. Um, they're kind of in the background, um, but I think that is a helpful way to think about the transition between the, the dissertation chapter and an article is topic versus argument. Um, um, so, so for instance, I'll give you an example. So sometimes I find you calling in a scholarly source that's relevant to a part of your argument, and then you lay out all of the evidence that they use to make their argument. And you don't need to do that. You can just call in the scholarly source um, and lean on them, lean on that citation um, without having to prove their case. They, they have to prove their case. <laughs> You're just relying on it or trusting um, that they've done it. You don't need to remake their case. Um, okay, so that's the first point in terms of moving from kind of uh, topic to argument. Um, following on that previous point, I think your argument needs to lead. It needs to be the structure. Um, and right now, I can see it there. I can see it kind of in the backbone. But um, I, I want it pulled up to be the structure and the skeleton um, of the paper. Um, sometimes 
I also want it to be in front. I want you to make a claim and then back up your claim with evidence and sources. Sometimes you have the sources as setup or context, and then you you get to, you arrive to the argument. And so that is, I think, a difference in, um, in uh, from a dissertation to an article. Um, okay, that's two. Third, um, right now the chapter reads as, all of the sources are on the same level. And so what you need to do is distinguish layers where there's higher order engagement with sources and lower order engagement with sources. So there are some sources and contexts that are really, really central to making your argument and some that are kind of ancillary, subsidiary. And those need to, we need to be able as readers to see those layers a bit more clearly. Um, I think all of these kind of go hand in hand, all of these points that I'm making. Um, so that's one more uh, thing. Um, and then fourth, I think you're making a larger point about gender, but you're using Simeon as the kind of illustrative case that makes your point. Um, I want Simeon much sooner. I want him and I want him to take up more space um, in the paper. Um, so yeah, okay, so those are my four kind of main points about organization and structure. Um, I've drawn up an outline for you in my notes um, so that I've kind of done the removing things around and what I think needs to stay and what stuff I've, I've kind of made a category of leftovers <laughs> that kind of can go or maybe can go in notes or maybe can kind of just be um, uh, moved down a layer, but, um, but I've drawn up an outline of what I think um, will work. So that's kind of big, big picture stuff. Um, in terms of the argument, um, the main point, again, I think you're making a persuasive argument. So I really don't have anything major to say. Um, I think that it would be helpful for me as a reader to hear more clearly, more boldly, with more nuance, what you're arguing, what you're finding. Um, you're very clear about what you're doing. Um, what your approach is, what your method is, um, but I I want you to articulate um, very much more specifically um, uh, how the unmanning works um, through these uh, bodily mortifications that you're seeing through suffering, et cetera. I want you to say that much more clearly and a couple of times, um, just so it's easier for us as the reader. We just have to kind of read it and not have to figure it out in our own brains. Um, um, the second major point about argument I would make is um, from the introductory framing, I expected a bit more on how suffering and pain worked to unman Simeon. Um, and that you kind of set up that expectation, but then I didn't see that as much followed through in the paper. I think you're onto something. I think there is something there. Um, uh, there's tons of new, great new scholarship on pain just in the last like three years. Um, so I think there's a lot to do with that. It could be though, Laura, that that's two separate articles. <laughs> so think strategically about how you might write two companion articles, one that um, is interested in these wounds and another that's interested in suffering. You could make a kind of master article that would be amazing, but also think about what you might need for jobs and tenure and promotion. I mean, just think strategically about that. Um, and then other little points. Um, I, I wasn't clear about terminology sometimes. Are the, is Simeon becoming unmale? Is he becoming unmanned? Is he becoming unmanly? I think those all mean something slightly different, different and um, you might want to think a bit more about which terms you're using and why. Um, I wanted to see critical edition citations in all the footnotes. So that's just something to go through and do um, later. And then um, I think the title doesn't quite capture what you're doing. So maybe we can think more about the title. I think there's more going on there. Um, yeah, okay, so I'll stop there. Sorry, I took up so much space. <laughs> all right, over to Ellen. I'm gonna second all of that. So I have a set of notes that essentially says all that, like the topic to argument shift. The fact, um, what we read proves such a deep reading of the field that I think you should feel confident that you have now built up this bank account of knowledge and command of what's been said that you can start writing um, much bigger checks, right? You're, um, 
what's here, I agree with Christy that like I see the argument and um, I would want to see it more bolder, more bolder, bold, more boldly, more nuanced. And that's what I mean by writing a bigger check. Like you've earned it. So why not just say it? Um, I, I have an, I, a thing to say about being kind of the other interlocutor in the article, which is that I don't know if this is clear or not. And I think I, everybody on this call is going to back me up. If you write something and it goes off into the ether and nobody ever like engages it or argues back, it's kind of like, uh. but if you write something and somebody argues against it, it's actually a huge compliment and it is amazing. So um, my advice would be if, if what you're arguing against is what I say in that Simeon article, do it um, more boldly and more bravely because as a reader, I'm going to be like, oh yeah, you know, either either, oh gosh, yes, she's right and I'm wrong about this, or, ah, you know, she has her view or whatever, but it's just, it's such a compliment to get engaged, which maybe is the opposite of what you might, like, you should feel free to argue back. Here's where I think you and I might differ, though, is that um, in my article, I stuck with one text and I made a, just a very specific literary claim. And what's not clear about your draft is, are you making a historical claim about Simeon and how everybody sees him? Because, you know, like you have these two points, you've got, um, you know, Greek sources and this one Syriac source, and they're kind of doing similar things. So is yours a wider cultural claim about how Simeon gets unmanned? If it is, then that's like, I mean, I, my article is very much in this one box. Like, let me show you Theodore, let me show you this one text, and let me show you how it gets read. So you're doing a bigger job than what my article did, which means you can just say that, right? Like, Milberger's article is limited to this one thing and it only makes a literary claim. She very specifically doesn't put Simeon in the line of transvestite saints. In part, I was aiming at saying, hmm, you know, maybe late ancient ascetic culture isn't always aimed at the masculine as the pinnacle of things. And I think your argument is the same. Like that's where you and I match up in that we're both saying, uh, male is not the apex of this whole system. And maybe male might not be the apex of the sex gender system either. Like you're citing that sort of um, the research about, you know, penetration determines who's on the top of the spectrum. Um, penetration makes you more male, being penetrated makes you more less male. It's gonna be an interesting balance to do that, like to work with that system, but then also say, look, here's Simeon, this extremely celebrated saint, whom the sources I'm looking at all on man in some way because that would suggest that masculinity isn't the apex, right? All of that is, all of what I've just said is currently present in your draft. It's just not the skeleton, like Christy said. And so I think that um, figuring out what unmanning means, what its implications are, is it literary or historical? Is it cross-cultural, i.e. you can see it in Greek and Syriac, and or maybe over a longer span of time? And does it say something to the broader ascetic culture, like answering those questions? And then once you've got an answer for those, re-outlining the thing and using only what you need for, um, for proving that point is the way forward. Um, let me look at my notes. Oh, I absolutely totally agree that um, now is the time to switch to uh, using critical editions and not using other people's translations, right? Like, so it's fine for your dissertation, but I think heading towards publication, one of the first things a reader might say is, oh, this is all in translation. Does this person know what they're doing? And the answer is yes, of course you do. But the way to show that to somebody who doesn't know you or maybe hasn't read other pieces of your work is to do the work in critical editions and make your own translations of things. Um, the other thing that might have might help a bit. And actually, I think I'm just repeating what Christy said is you don't have to narrate other people's work, right? Like we can go read their stuff if we if we want to. But what we're interested in is Smith's argument about this needs the following bricks to support it, and that's it. And I again, it's all there. This is not a moment where you have to go do more research or even really go do much more other than sit at a table and articulate what unmanning means and what the stakes are just a little bit more. You know, it's like, it's like turning a dial. We're at volume number five and you need to turn it to 10. That's it. So um, 
that's it for me. I don't want to steal thunder because there's probably a lot of us are going to echo these same points. But as the person with whom you're arguing, I'm like, please just argue. Like, let's do it because we know each other. We are friends. It's not going to offend anybody. In fact, it is quite a compliment to get that kind of engagement, especially if you prove me wrong. So that's good. Thank you. Over to Taylor. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited about this paper. And Laura, I hope that you walk away from this conversation encouraged. I've been on the other end of these things sometimes and it can feel like, oh, I have to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> you know. And, and I hope that you walk away feeling like how excited we all are about this. And it was such a wonderful piece and really showed a lot of, uh, of skill and competence. Let me ask a, a, a question to you, Laura, just right at the start, just to make sure that I'm also understanding the map of how this fits into the larger Simeon scholarship, which I'm not as familiar with as, as maybe some of the other folks Folks here, are you the first to argue that this is a self castration uh, uh, description, or is that sort of commonly accepted? Um, so Alan alludes to you. You make a, a brief um, comment about um, the possibility of castration um, in in her in her article, um, but I don't think I haven't found anything um anywhere else no okay excellent so that that helps and that will help maybe frame uh, some of my my, my comments as well because i had some i sorry i accidentally muted myself had some questions uh, around that but let me start with um first a set of interpretive questions where i think that there can be a little bit more conceptual clarity at least for me around the questions of gender and sexuality that you're engaging. And I think uh, Ellen and Christy are kind of raising some of these points as well. But I just had a lot of questions about where I think there could just be some, a little bit more precision and where I think that the kind of thing that you're pointing out here can actually take the conversation forward about how we think about gender and sexuality in ways beyond many of the kinds of paradigms that you're citing around penetration and, and, and so on. And, um, and, and so a few things to kind of point out here. One is that I think that there is some asymmetry in the discourses around female saints becoming male and the kind of thing that you're doing of an unmanning of, uh, of, of uh, a Simeon. It's not that he's becoming female, right? And there's an asymmetry there that I think is actually like re potentially really interesting to kind of work out. Um, and that asymmetry shows up in the way that you uh, sort of use different kinds of language here. Sometimes you describe him as being feminized. Sometimes you describe him as being degendered. And um, and uh, you you refer in some cases to the literature around eunuchs as being a third sex. And so I think that there is a little bit more like you could you could just hone in on that to say, hey, the female saints are being turned into men, but the male saints are being done, something different is being done with them rather than just say that they are the same, right? Um, and, uh, and so maybe there's something about a neuter position or a third sex position, which is available to men, which might not be available to the female saints. So I, again, I think that's an important conversation partner piece for you, but, but, but at least as I'm reading how this is, how the article plays out, I'm seeing some slippage or some differences there that are actually, for me, really produ potentially produ productive. Um, along these lines, you know, some of the paradigms that you're using, uh, you know, we talked about penetration already, um, suffering. Uh, Christy brought this one up here too, and I think that the literature around um, pain and suffering, and and especially like the fact that he's not suffering, his his sort of stoic apathy here might actually be a sign of masculinity in some cases. So I want you to maybe un play out the readings, the potential uh, different kinds of readings of what's going on with gender here. Um, and along those lines, a lot of the things about, you know, bleeding and cutting and, and, and pain and scarring and, and those kinds of things in the martial literature and athletic literature might be doing something differently about gender than um, than in the sexual realm per se, and at least to maybe have some acknowledgement that he might be being depicted in you know an athletic contest here, and and his suffering and bleeding and pain might actually not necessarily be feminizing here. So I, I think that there are just maybe multiple layers of what's happening with gender that can really enrich 
uh, uh, what, what's, what, what you see in some of these sources. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Oh, along these lines too, when you do get to the female becoming male literature, I thought there were also maybe some potential distinctions because in some cases it was around virtues. Um, it was that, that females become male or it, at, at the level of virtue. And in other cases, it really is an embodied practice as well. Um, and that there is, uh, again, multiple layers of where gender is happening here that, that, that might be helpful for, for that, especially in the, uh, the bodily transitions, I thought were the most important for, for your argument and uh, to at least acknowledge that there is some, some difference there. Because it's not the case, for instance, that Simeon is becoming female in his virtues uh, or is being unmanned in his virtues, at least, uh, you know, may, maybe you would disagree with that, but in my reading of how you're laying out the evidence. Um, uh, okay, now, in terms of this being a, um, a castration scene, there were a couple of evidentiary questions that I had that I wanted to just make sure were maybe tightened up a little bit uh, for, for this. Um, I think that you make a compelling case in the biblical literature and in the, the uh, uh, in, in um, what was the other one that you used? Uh, Homer, there, there we go, that the feet as a sort of uh, uh, euphemism for the genitals is there. Maybe it's there in the Jesus's sayings in the New Testament as well. I wonder if there are some more contemporaneous sources where we might see this, uh, uh, this euphemism being used because most of that other literature is from a thousand plus years before. And so, you know, is, the, is there a case to be, to be made? And if not, and you, but you still think it's happening there, then I think there's another question which is why are these authors using this as a euphemism? What's the purpose? Why not just say <laughs> he did this to, you know, uh, why are they being euphemistic? And that's another really interesting potential question here. It could be because castration is frowned upon, it's forbidden, you know, they're, 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 so they're trying to hide it in some way or, or just making some case of why this euphemism is being used, especially if it's an archaic one and maybe not necessarily contemporaneous. Uh, related to that is um, Antonius's claim here that he stood on one foot because of the injury, because of the because of the, um, the thing. And I'm just wondering how that fits with that as being a castration scene. If he's standing on one foot, it seems to imply that it is a, the other foot is is the one. So so maybe there are some people who are reading this as the literal foot, or maybe they ha they haven't understood the the uh, euphemism and, or, or something, or maybe it's, it's contested or, or just, you know, again, I, I, as I read that, I, it, for me, it was like, oh, you should at least acknowledge that that seems to be referring to a foot instead of a, a foot, right? Um, and let's see, I think that was, I think that was everything. But again, like I, I have some suggestions of where to cut and how to do this, but, but follow what Christy and Ellen say about those things. I'll send you my copy where I point out a few areas where uh, you, you can scale it back and summarize it in one sentence or one paragraph or something like that. But again, thank you for the really exciting paper. It was super fun and uh, glad to see you engaging these questions. Thank you. So we'll turn it over now to Christian. Okay. What to say after all these uh, excellent comments, I think that I can mainly echo what has been uh, said already and I'll try to, to add some things. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, Laura, I will also just uh, ask you some questions and then we can have like like a little uh, discussion perhaps. And I will send you uh, my comments uh, afterwards, of course. So first of all, I, I think we really need to distinguish between uh, the chapter for, for a PhD and then your plans for, for a publication. So uh, if I were to be your, your supervisor uh, for, for the PhD, I would just say that this is an, an, a beautiful and excellent chapter, really. Uh, you write very well. This is very sound scholarship. So you in solid scholarship, you know the sources, you, you know how to uh, put forward your argument. It's, it makes a good read. It's very thorough. So that is all. I think it's excellent, really, as a, as a chapter for a PhD. So congratulations for that. Now. Of course, I will re-echo what, what people have uh, been saying before. Um, if you want to turn this into a uh, scholarly paper, 
that's of course a very different thing than than a chapter of a dissertation. I'd say you need to size it down considerably, and I would even say perhaps cut half of it. And I know that this is, is a can be a painful exercise to, to use a sort of metaphor uh, you used, but it's really uh, a thing you need to consider why. Um, this has been said before already too. So there's so many things an uh, audience of a scholarly uh, journal will already know. I think you could basically say in one paragraph what you have been doing now in, in many pages uh, for things like, like masculinity, for instance, in the, in the impenetrability of the male body and the eunuch and so on and so on. So, so there's tons of literature on this and it's always a good exercise really to uh, say for yourself, okay, how can I just summarize this in, 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 in one page or in, in one paragraph or something? So that's an exercise you need to do at, at at some point, but it will be useful. And again, this is different from writing a PhD because I'd like to emphasize this as for a PhD chapter, it's it's really uh, excellent stuff. And I think it's also a great idea. I just, for myself, I, I noted down many uh, different, uh, many uh, references. And it's also a brilliant idea, I think, to, to access the, the female body also by going, uh, uh, by having a look at a case of of the of the male body, that's for sure. Um, let me have a look at my notes now. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I also had some some things about uh, use. Yeah, about uh, for instance your um, uh, use of the Greek term. So uh, sometimes it's like transliteration. Sometimes you use the uh, original Greek letters. So for for an article, of course, it would be better to to use the Greek. Also, some things on the the critical editions. But that has been said also. And just also for sizing down, if you what you do now, of course, in the footnotes, first time you you give the full reference uh, to the article or the book, and then you do the same in the bibliography again so if you if you change that that would already uh, cut something like a few pages perhaps so that so that would also help for the uh, for the paper now uh, let me have a look i also had notes on uh, suffering and pain that has been said before too and i can supply you with some additional bibliography on stoicism that has been said too on athletes of god so so the idea of like really being like a strong athlete is, is, is surely there also in some passages but i think this has been said too yeah so this is i think if if i um i completely agree with you and this is also a cross-cultural thing that that feet are often also uh, used in an, uh, let's say, with sort of erotic meaning, absolutely, and 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 you really prove that also in in what you uh, write. But if I were just to, well, if I just want to have a discussion with you now, and if I would say that um, that you don't really make clear for hundred percent that with feet uh, genitals are meant. What would be your short answer to this? If I would say, okay, this is fine. Um, there's all sorts of references to erotic connotations and then if, well, even some connotations which may come close to, well, going to the toilet, uh, genitals and so on and so on. But, but what if I would say, could you give me one case that really <laughs> proves to say so that uh, with feet, uh, genitals are meant so that amputation of the feet would mean or one foot would mean um, castration. What would be your answer to this somewhat provocative question? So just in order for for, for yourself to make clear what, what you're actually meaning here. Um I think that's I think that's tough. Um I think <laughs> sorry. I I think I think my feeling was that the kind of sources together demonstrate mm -hmm. Gen the genitals, um, the various euphemistic uses, various mm -hmm. other uses, when they're together, suggest feet. And I, uh, sorry, suggest genitals. Um, I think the, um, the, the sources from the Hebrew Bible are stronger in proving the point, but further away in time and possibly kind of 
social use so so I I felt that I that was actually a section that I was thinking of taking out um I yeah I would struggle actually to answer okay. that off of my head okay Okay, so it's it's just a thing to to think about because yeah. I, I I may imagine if if you would submit this to a journal that would be a question a, a referee could ask you about you know so so just just uh, uh, think about it uh, and so my other maybe even a tougher question would be do you think that um, Jacob in writing this was he really um, thinking himself was he aware that this was actually about self castration and genitals. Or would it be something, I don't know, Freudian or just that, that he wasn't really consciously aware of it? Um, and, and what about, I know that is even more tough, but, but I will just ask it. What about, about the intended audience? Do you think they would have understood the amputation of the foot as uh, self-castration? Or would that require a very sophisticated reader and perhaps not uh everyone in, in in the audience for which the text originally was um intended what would you say there i know this is very difficult i also struggle always with these things like what would have been the the audience but but uh, do you have any thoughts on this um i yeah i i i've definitely kind of thought about that but i think so i think about hagiography as a bit like the simpsons you know the cartoon because you can what you when you watch Simpsons, you can watch it on multiple levels. Yes. Mm -hmm. so as a child, you can watch it and you have a different understanding as you would as an adult. Mm -hmm. And so I think with hagiography, there's so many layers of understanding. So a lot of the scholarship on, on female bodies in, in aesthetic literature, where they're talking about um, drying out of the body, I don't think that would have been understood by kind of by every person who heard or read the text, I think that's a very um, scholarly understanding of of those women's bodies. Um, so I, I would argue that no, not everybody would have understood it in those terms. Um, but the kind of theologians who engaged with the text may have um, and I think a lot of the the literature um, a lot a lot of aesthetic literature really demonstrates that there was this understanding of um, um, of of ancient medicine um, and you know the treaties are using those understandings of ancient medicine to justify um, the things that they're doing with their bodies and so I think that's it's not a um, um, it's not inconceivable that that will then filter through into the hagiography itself yeah I think that's a, a very good answer and 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 I uh, I'd encourage you to 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 think and, and further think about this and also to to uh, make it more explicit if 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 you are going to to write a, a paper about this because that is of course one of the first things I think um uh, referees or reviewers um will think about when I will send you my notes uh, Laura there will also be a reference to a, a book that might be very useful for all this it's by uh, the late uh, Jim Adams, uh, the Latin sexual vocabulary. So I know that may sound a bit further away from your team, but uh, what what Adams really does is in a sort of lexicographical tradition, he will just browse through all sorts of terms which have um, sexual or erotic connotations in Latin. But in doing so, he has a very open eye also for uh, the Greek tradition. So I'm sure, I, I don't have the book here right now with me in Bonn, but, but I'm almost sure that if you would just uh, check on, on pace, the, the word for uh, foot, um, you will find uh, perhaps plenty of, of, of other references or allusions about either feet uh, being erotic or even sort of synonym for uh, for genitals so i think it, it's it's uh christian i'm just gonna step in here just because in thinking uh mindful of time yeah uh, 
and we've already gotten into a dialogue, which we which is fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, but we also still want to hear from Victoria and Brenda, and then so I'm wondering if we can like move to those yes. two and then um, and then come back to discussion at the end, uh, whatever time is okay. Left. That's fine. I wasn't aware of the format. Uh, apologies for that, but, but no. Uh, I think I've said what I wanted to say and I will send the rest, but but congratulations again, Laura, for this very, very nice chapter. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you so much, Christian. So, Victoria. Thank you. Okay. So, Laura, I hope you're, um, this is so much information. I hope you're not feeling too overwhelmed. Uh, also give you greetings from Midlands Massive, seeing as you're down the road in Birmingham. And uh, yeah, we, we should, I hope to see you at the Classical Association Conference in, War in Warwick in 2024. Um, anyway, right, back to this. Okay, so when I looked at this, I, I'm not going to say, I'm really going to try not to repeat. So I'm, um, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to repeat what other people have already said. Um, so when I looked at this, then I concentrated, I highlighted the bit in, in your instructions as to what you wanted, because I know that you want you want this to go into as a journal article. Um, you don't need me to tell you that it's a great PhD thesis chapter, like <laughs> world experts today have already done that. And it is like if my PhD student wrote this as a chapter, then I'd be really glad. I'd be very glad to read this. Um, OK, so my feedback, is, my feedback is designed to help push the chapter from the part of from being part of a thesis into a journal article um and i'm doing this at the moment with not not with my thesis but with an article following a peer review and uh also talking about euphemisms and what does sexual assault mean and we're looking at something but we're not really looking at it so like i basically feel your pain with this um but i do think you've done a really good job i think overall the pace of the piece could be a bit faster so as a reader i wanted you to take me by the hand and show me your argument but i also want you to pull me along like i want you i want to go in and through i want to go in and through with you i don't want to get to the end of a paragraph thinking hmm i'm not sure about this or oh, i'd like to know more about this like you want to stick to your reader you want to try and make the reader stick to you um and that's that's a confidence trick i think as much as anything else that is and that's not easy to do at your career stage when you're a PhD student looking to publish. But I think this is really good advice that is hard to see now, but that actually writing a journal article is very different to writing a thesis. Um, and with a thesis, you have you have an instinct to put everything in to show your learning and your examiners will want to see that. They'll want to know that you, you know, you can look at over 1000 years of the history of an idea, um, but that's not what the journal editor will want to see. Like anything like that is just going to get cut. I think. The, I think the piece for me, like I was thinking about 8,000 words, this would be a, about right for a journal article. That's what I would be aiming for. That's without notes, um, because that basically means that you can argue, you can make your argument well, but you're not going to argue too much. Or you're not going to be tempted to like have two different arguments. Um, I think it's a real leap to do restructuring. And I do think that people, when they get feedback, they're limited in, as, as to what they can implement with other people's visions. And I think I can see how this could be restructured and the bits to cut quite clearly, but I'm pretty sure that you won't be able to see that quite as well. So I don't know. I guess I'm 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 hoping that you can that first of all you can hear all the positives that people have said because you should take this as the first peer review, right? Because what actually you've got is an assembly of scholars here who are who are world leaders. This is this is your peer review, and it's actually a much harder peer review in some ways because we're doing it face to face, and you've got loads of us like a peer external peer review. It would be anonymous, and you'd have like a paragraph where someone just says mean things about your work, basically. Um, <laughs> so. I think you you take the positives and you have that confidence trick where you think, right, well, I can do this now. All these people have said I can do it. And Ellen was so generous when she said, argue against me, like, this is fine. Because as a PhD student, I would feel like I really couldn't do that. But yeah, you do have to, you do have to do it properly. Um, but you definitely do have to do that. And I think any journal editor will also want to see quite focused engagement with what has been written most recently. Um, so they want to see that um, rather than kind of, because I think what you did quite a lot with the piece was actually position your ideas through other people's ideas. And I think you always need to be in control of what you're saying. You need to be in control of your analysis. Try not to end paragraphs with a quotation, like always end with your own words. Like every paragraph should be like a little essay where you have like a little instruction. Then you have the main body where you're, where you're arguing your point, like hopefully only really one point, And then you have a concluding sentence. Um, and if you don't have those three elements, then the reader, the reader can get lost. Like my hands just slipped out of yours a little bit. Um, and it's difficult 
to pick back up with that. I think this that will really help though the cutting down. Um, if you can do that to get it to be more snappy um, and to be more streamlined. I, and it was it was obvious to me where I wouldn't say obvious, like it's not like there were some really bad bits or anything, but there were there were places that I thought, yes, that's really useful and that all that information can underlie where you're arguing here, but actually that can be cut. Um, what else do I need to say? I'm just trying to I'm just trying to go through my notes quickly. Yeah, also what Christy said about putting Simi in front of centre, totally agree with that. Like I think you if I was gonna if I was gonna advise like serious restructuring, then I would say Simeon starts. Um and then you integrate you integrate um the information that you've got here around Simeon, not the other way around. Um you also don't do it biographically. So I was thinking like I, it's so rubbish isn't it when people say well you should have done this because that's the article they would have written but if I was writing this article then I would look at it through um I would I would think about scrutiny visibility and agency and how those are gendered in aesthetic context so I wouldn't think okay these are my these are my two sources or my three sources that I'm going to analyze and this is Simeon I would think about these themes and again that's a lot of restructuring but maybe just those those three kind of buzzwords they you don't need to restructure the whole piece maybe it's maybe just like a bit of reframing like just swapping around the emphasis of a sentence even or where the paragraph has the emphasis um all of your journal suggestions are really good i'd look particularly at Jex and gender and history i think um i've received some really horrible peer reviews basically from um oh this is gonna sound so mean i hope none of you have a peer reviewed my work but like people who just can't who don't, don't have enough brain cells to understand that gender isn't necessarily a binary um so i think i think christian's idea is really christian's advice is really good in that you're you're kind of you're trying to kind of second guess what the the complaints the peer review is going to make because they're going to make some complaints right but really what you want them to say is um you missed out on this bibliography and you could have a section on this and a section on that and you just need to slim down the introduction into two par one paragraph rather than two rather than like you've misunderstood castration um and I, I do think like what I put in the chat there about like we're looking at castration, but we're not looking at it. Like I quite like I, I quite like the swirl of gender here and the ambiguity. I think you've got to be careful. Like you can't take the ambiguity and replicate it entirely in your critical analysis. But I also think that like, you can't really stamp all over it as well. Like you have to try and reflect that ambiguity as well, because that's part of the text. That's part of and that's a really important journey for the reader as well. Um, OK, I'm just going to stop talking because I'm talking really fast, I know. And I hope you can go back and like do this on the recording. But yeah, great piece. Well done. Brilliant. Great. Thank you so much, Victoria. And finally, over to Brenda. Hi, thanks. Thank you for uh, including me in this uh, conversation. I will. I don't think I'm going to repeat, repeat anything anyone has said just to you know agree. I don't want to talk about this as a dissertation chapter versus article because I'm reading a dissertation chapter. Um, and it is your chapter, it's not our chapter. So you can ignore everything that has just been said in the past 54 minutes, if you want, because you are now an expert in this. Um, I thought your chapter was clever and interesting. Um, I can't count how many boring presentations I've sat through on Simi and the Stylite that, that teach me nothing new and bless them. Um, but uh, it's the first, your, your chapter is the sort of the first original idea about Simeon to come out in probably more, at least to a decade. So I think that's, I think that's really a significant achievement. Um, and there was enough in there about feet that I'll never watch a Tarantino film the same way ever again. I now understand that genre. Uh, I do. Now I know why he likes feet. I did totally. And speaking of feet, um, Speaking of feet, um, I want to comment on on Christian's question to you um, because uh, I can help you defend why feet could refer to genitals. Because in contemporary hagiography, um, a discussion of genitals, thighs, and whatnot is going to be used to humiliate the object of discussion. Um, and so, talking about uh, Simeon's genitals would be unseemly. Um, you know, hagiographers are interested in obscuring because they're they're not giving us all the details for certain reasons. So um, your argument, uh, I, I agree with it. Um, it. You know, when is a foot just a foot? Uh, I think in this case, it's not just a foot. Um, 
What I would offer um, for me uh, in my read, I'm just going to read what I wrote so that I don't wander off down a rabbit hole. Um, you write, and I'm quoting you, um, scholars have identified a vital need to underpin current discussions of contemporary transgender matters with historical approaches, so on and so forth. I hope my work will become part of this conversation. Um, I think, so here's, here's, here's my point about that. I think if I hadn't read your intro page about this being part of a bigger project on women's bodies, um, I would have thought this was a chapter about a man. Um, and so for me, the piece that is not as clear is this being about a female body. So um, I'm not gonna ask you to cut or summarize or put anything in the notes. I'm gonna ask you to write a little more, which you can ignore <laughs> because you're free, you're free to do so. But it, knowing that this is part of a bigger project about the female body, I, um, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't have thought this was about the female body. And maybe that's my bad read, right? Maybe that's my bad read. Um, the other, the, the other thing is, um, as this relates to trans, critical trans studies, which you introduced me to, by the way. So I read your chapter and these as well. So thanks for that, <laughs> which was, you know, both good, but also what I hadn't planned to do this week, <laughs> but it was, it was great. And um, I think that if you're hoping that this would be part of um, that conversation, then working more with the female body would be really important for entering into trans critical theory. I hope that, does that make sense? I did go down the rabbit hole, but anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of this. I'm happy to read anything again, if you need it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, everyone. And actually we are at time because we do really want to be timely and respectful of, of, our, of our moments. Um, so, so in a perfect world, we would have another hour where we would just have lots and lots of very vibrant conversation, but we need to withhold that for um, another venue. Uh, so a reminder that the, you know, the instructions to upload your written notes of your feedback into the, into the drive folder. Um, and I will, uh, I will thank everyone so much for, for your participation. It has just been a real gift. And, um, Christy, Heidi, did you want to add anything? Laura, did you want to say anything? Um, I'm slightly overwhelmed, um, but I just wanted to say such a massive thank you. Um, and thank you for your time. I really know how precious everyone's time is. So thank you so much. And thank you. I, I, I'm very excited because I kind of, I just want to, I, I, I feel like, I just want to start doing this now rather than write my conclusions. So that's not necessarily a good thing, but thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for facilitating Susan and keeping yeah. us all on track. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Laura, it was really wonderful. <laughs> oh, I was, I've been so nervous. Oh, oh my gosh. That was a really great response from, as uh, Victoria said, just world-class scholars. You should feel so proud of yourself. Well, just having all those people in the same place is just <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and now the great thing is now you've made contact. I'm going to stop recording you've made contact with all of those people so you can feel